um, an international <laughs> uh, Let me know if you're not understanding anything I'm saying. Um, but a little bit about me briefly, Lucy. Um, I actually have an economics and sociology background and, and some marketing. I spent a while in, in doing corporate work uh, before I saw the light and thought it was better to start my own game than play someone else's. And um, yeah, it's, it's been it's been a pretty wild ride. Hex has grown from a small little study abroad business with you know two three people to uh, a scaling um, edtech with now nineteen staff. So that's uh, pretty exciting. And and we we um, closed our very first seed round earlier this year. And I'm coming back coming back next year for a Series A. So Lucy, I'll uh, I'll chat to you later. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, Amit, do you want to go next? Sure. Thanks. Uh hey everyone good evening or good afternoon or good night wherever you are thanks for joining and thanks for having us uh, early work team uh, my name is amit i'm the ceo and co-founder of sasguru um, sasguru is a, a skills and workforce development pro, uh, platform and what we really help our learners do is get skilled for the jobs in the hottest technologies today which are salesforce aws uh, google etc and do it in a very unique way. Um, and we'll talk about it later, I'm sure. Uh, the reason why we're doing it is uh, the skill crisis that all of us hear about, feel about, feel as founders is really reached the breaking point. And, and that's probably the biggest reason uh, why tech or businesses are failing or could fail in the future. So on one hand, you have millions of people who are ready to be part of the workforce. On the other hand, you have millions of open positions with the leading organizations in, in these tech careers. But the bridge between those two is, is, is suboptimal. So we're really trying to uh, you know, iron out that supply chain through our skills and workforce development program. And um, just a year old, uh, we've got learners from 20 different countries, uh, about 35,000 learners now, a, a dozen corporates who use us. And we're very lucky to have Square Peg uh, do our seed round uh, end of last year, and and very very fortunate to be part of that portfolio in building this. Thanks for having us, Dean. Go ahead. Hi everyone. My name is Dean. I am the CEO and co-founder of a Sydney-based edtech startup called Canopy Study. We, oh wow, we started Canopy Study back in when I was in uni, so a few years ago. And we started for three main reasons. There's that one, students aren't taught how to learn effectively. Two, it's very, very time consuming, even if you know how to learn effectively to create good learning resources. And three, we believe that world-class education should not be a privilege, but something that everyone can experience. So our goal is to take today's education, uh, to today's technology, sorry, uh, like AI, and apply that to innovative, apply that in innovative ways to try and provide world-class education worldwide. And I think that's, that's, you know, that's huge. And I'm just really keen to get into that later on when we start talking about um, higher education and how that should be more accessible. But yeah, we, we started about two years ago. It's been a very, very awesome ride. Uh, we raised the seed round in January, uh, have been growing our team since and uh, working, that, working all the hiring out, which is a lot of fun. And uh, yeah, it's, it's been fantastic so far. So I'm really keen to get into, get into the uh, AI side of things and the tech and the innovation side of things. That's, that's my, ball, my ball game. Awesome. I might actually start um, diving deep into higher education space, the space that Jeanette and Dean, you both play in. Um, it sounds like, Jeanette, you have some very strong opinions about how the existing system is kind of failing students. I'd love to just understand from your perspective, what are the sort of the biggest gaps that you see today and where is sort of technology able to, to sort of fundamentally change um, how we deliver 
Thanks, Lucy. Um, yeah, definitely have some strong opinions. Uh, the, the relationship that I describe Hex having with the higher education sector is kind of like frenemies. You know, we, we, we're, we're here, we're here to help, we support them, we do business with them, but we're also here to give them a really sharp elbow in the ribs to say, hey guys, like you're really not serving the needs of, of emerging students. Um, one of the ways I think that they're absolutely failing at is you know, the, a, a, the length, all right, we, I think we can all agree four years to, you know, potentially get a job is too long or not get a job. Um, I think we can all agree that the, the currency of content is completely uh, lagging. We know that even the best universities can take up to two years to approve a new subject. And I mean, Amit and Dean will tell you that that's like way too long <laughs> to get anything new up, on, um, up into a degree. Um, we're also just seeing like this hugely increasing number of people just degree hopping and wasting so much time and money, like bouncing around, um, deferring, choosing degrees and just like not really knowing what they want to do before they actually enroll in, in a degree. So I have this opinion that you need something after high school or before you choose higher education that's actually going to allow you to a explore safely so you're not actually like wasting time um you can still potentially roll over your life experience or your learning to academic credit should you choose to go down a university path um it gives you the space to kind of like you know explore things that you really love to do but it's also a brand new capability layer um we talk about this concept of exponential intelligence, right? It's like people have IQ for how smart you are, EQ for how good you are with people. And I think there's an XQ, which is how likely you are to thrive in an ever-changing world. Um, and so I want to build something that's going to help people improve and track their XQ over time, which eventually will, um, you know, hopefully translate into the job market and uh, success in, in measuring startups and leadership as well. I covered a bit there, so I'll bounce uh, <laughs> over you, Dean. That's cool. No, I really, I, I like the point you made about um, content being outdated because when I was doing a, a comp sci degree, and this is only about three, four years ago, I remember there was a few slides on like t uh, existing technology and it was a photo of a BlackBerry phone. And yeah, uh, cool. that, yeah. totally relevant <laughs> to your life. <laughs> this is in a world where, you know, at the time we had iPhone 9s, 10s, whatever it was, the Xs. And uh, I was thinking, why is there a slide on Nokia's and Blackberries? Like, how, where, when am I living in? It was yeah. So, so poorly outdated. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, I'd love to speak on like gaps in terms of, I mean, how far out there's so many from what accessibility to students' social and emotional well being as well. I think that's a huge one. Um, there's been, an enormous decline in student attendance at uni and engagement in lectures, largely due to the impact of COVID um, that COVID had on the students that were inaugurated over the last couple of years. Uh, that created a massive gap in student engagement with course content, yes, but also social engagement. Um, I mean, it's evident just seeing the sheer number of students asking to make friends on things like forum boards um, or just talking to students in general, you know, there's an overall sentiment of like students don't come into uni, uh, they like don't engage with each other. And it's overall a quite lonely experience now. And I think that's a really bad thing in education, especially when learning should be very social. Uh, so I think there's a huge gap in terms of the ability for students to be social. Um, and you know, that from when I was at uni, that was a huge thing is like, you're always at uni learning from other people, um, because there was group, you know, group work and everything. And like, that is definitely lacking at the moment. Uh, I mean, I kind of be study. We're focusing on a bit of a different issue. Our gap is really like looking at the fact that great education is more of a privilege, right? And this comes in two parts, I think. Uh, the first requires understanding that like how humans learn and what really is good education before you look at like how is that a privilege and I won't go too into depth because there's so much there but at least when we look into like countless research studies into what are the most effective methods for learning right we find immediately that students are students that have two students that are two t's of one-on-one -on -one tutoring result in significantly higher grades than non-tutored students. So we can start there, right? Because that's a huge thing in itself. And I, I experienced this myself as, as I was a high, when I was in high school, when I coming into year 10 and 11, I was at an average grade of 65 in math. 
and I was like uh, my parent, uh, I was like to my parents mom I need a tutor and so I was asking for a tutor got a tutor very fortunate that I could have that and resulted in me getting the highest score in, in my whole grade in HSC for math and I would attribute a lot of that to the tutor um, but then then herein lies the second part which is that you know there are a lot of phenomenal teachers and tutors out there but unfortunately they're not accessible to everybody right not affordable to everybody so when you look at things like private tutoring for instance uh, private tutoring in Australia you know this hourly rates range from anywhere between $30 an hour to $120 an hour uh, depending on the tutor and of course that's not only not only not affordable for the vast majorities of families but let alone even accessible to the majority of the world's population you know where education in itself is not accessible, let alone having a private tutor to teach you the content and understand your learning gaps and understand what you need to know. That's like massive, right? So, you know, we really believe that like worldwide education, worldwide world-class education, right? Is using hmm. technology to close this gap. And I really think you can start to do that by providing one-on-one -on -one tutoring on a global scale. So you can imagine having a one-on-one -on -one tutor at a fraction of the cost or even free, you know, if possible in, a, in, a, in an ideal world where good education should not be a privilege to anyone around the world. And so I think for us, at least, we're trying to close that gap and we're trying to do so using AI uh, to, to try and solve that issue at least. Um, I believe it's strongly viable. I mean, it sounds like a huge task, but I really, really think within this decade, anyone with an internet connection in, in lower socioeconomic areas of, I don't know, anywhere around the world, say the Philippines, will have equal opportunity to access world-class education, the same as a Harvard student, you know, paying 20 grand a year. Uh, and I think that is a huge gap that needs to be addressed. And I, I, I strongly believe so will be in, in, in the current decade. Awesome. Um, one thing, I guess, obviously, I think there's probably general acknowledgement of the the gaps and and sort of the the challenges with the space that you you've mentioned. I guess one of the things that VCs probably always stare into here, and and I'm definitely guilty of it, is this question around, you know, there's so much of that higher education space that's tied to government funding, tied to sort of you know really slow moving you know universities and schools and, and that makes the go-to-market and the monetization part of it incredibly incredibly difficult for founders what have been your sort of experiences and, and learnings on sort of that go-to-market motion and and how you handle entities that are so kind of stale they're, they're worse than corporate <laughs> <laughs> I can Dan, imagine. were you throwing that to me <laughs> yeah well I was gonna say the exact same thing <laughs> yeah yeah but yeah I mean there's also a question in the um in the slide which is similar around secondary education as well so um I mean I can answer a little bit from our perspective and then and pass back to the crew but I uh, I actually think that's one of the if I'm being really honest like I think disrupting the funding model in universities has actually been one of the strengths of HEX we recruited very um very deliberately from within the higher education sector, we picked a couple of people that just knew how to do the uni admin finance inside out and could kind of almost like break it from the inside. Like they knew the language, they knew the jargon, they understood what how it currently worked and were able to find the right um, innovators in the right places. So, I mean, when we first worked with RMIT to get academic credit for a two week program in Silicon Valley, um, we knocked on, I think we had 30, 40 meetings before we found the right person. But once you find the right person, it unlocks all of this stuff. And so we, once we realised we could actually attach things to academic credit, that unlocked things like scholarships from the university, federal government funding, scholarships, um, overseas help, you could roll, roll loans over. Um, it unlocked kind of like things like a new Colombo plan grant, which is to get Aussie students engaged with Southeast Asia and Southeast Asian students engaged. Like you just have to kind of like keep digging. And I think um, if you are looking to disrupt uh education in, in any sort of level, whether it's K to 12 or, or uni, if you deliberately recruit from that sector to someone who's like, their job is to break it. Like when we talk about the hacker hipster hustler personas 
our first version of the hacker was that person. It wasn't necessarily tech. It was like, let's break the money. Um, so yeah, <laughs> that, that was our experience with it. Um, yeah, I'd be curious to hear what others have to say. I mean, for, for me, yeah, I, coming into it with a very naive and fresh perspective, uh, we found that in general, educational institutions are just terrible to sell to. <laughs> um, it's a bureaucratic nightmare. And, and I think Jeanette, you're absolutely right. If you don't have the right people, it makes it very, very difficult to navigate. And so for us, that, that was it. It was like very difficult. It was looking at like, what are the, you know, looking at six month sales cycles or longer um, and just trying to talk, navigate who to talk to. Uh, within within the unis and that was huge learning curve for us because you know we came into it thinking it was not going to be that difficult it'd just be like selling to a business but no it's way harder uh, and you know that resulted in a lot of change uh, in our business model like we started looking at for us it was looking at tutoring companies because that and that, you know, that way you're not you know talking to the librarian and then the IT department and then like you know xyz it's just like here's the here's the person that makes the decisions and you talk to them and they can make the sales so that that was very different um and yeah the, again there were a lot of learning curves we started looking at okay instead of b to b to c which is through the uni uh looking at you know what what if we went b to c and we went directly to the to the parents who are paying for the students education um that was a very different route we're we're still navigating that now and looking into it uh, but I think also like there was just trying to sell to um, higher education or just trying to sell to uh, B2B customers in general, though, it's easy to fall prey to consuming their feedback, like it's verbal gold. Uh, and that is one of the problems we fell into. So that was one of the challenges we experienced is that, you know, when you have these uh, organizations or the the educational institutions asking for things like roles permissions workspaces administration auditing tools uh, whatever it is you know it's like next thing you know you're building a product that has nothing to do totally. with the innovation you're trying to build and it's all because the customer's like oh yeah but we're going to need this to do this and we're going to need this for auditing and we're you know if you want to make the sale you're going to have to add it <laughs> and uh, uh that's such a massive trap, isn't it? Because you can just oh. keep building it for anyone who's selling to enterprise, right? Oh, yeah. Well, exactly. I mean, that's why, like, we experienced it with educational institutions, but I'm sure that's just building for enterprise in general. I'm sure that a lot of people would run into that. And for us, it was, yeah, it was like, holy crap. We got to a point where we realized we have just built an application with all these extra features just for the institutions so that they would go through with the sales. And we're like, hang on. We, we sat down because we were about to build a feature uh, for roles and permissions. And it was like really well thought out. And we we're like, okay, this is going to take us a month to implement. And we thought, but that's a month away from innovating on what we currently have. That's a month away from building, like going towards where we're actually trying to go. And it, it's like pulling us away from our direction. And we, we sat there and we're like, no, this is bad. <laughs> this is really bad. And so... Yeah, we made a lot of changes there, but that's definitely a challenge we came across. And we've, we're, you know, I would highly, highly uh, put a put a big warning sign out there for anyone, especially in ed tech, or trying to um, trying to sell to institutions. There's so many so many demands that come up um, that are just like not even to do with your product. They're just like base features that are just very difficult. For us, like, we do a oh, little yeah. work with. Uh, uh, academic institutes and uh, the way we have gone about it is really uh, engaging with the end users, the learners first, and really creating a groundswell of users within the university. And then going back to the university saying, hey, this is what your students are gaining from our program. Would you like to work with us in formalizing our program as part of your curriculum. So it's pretty much like the Slack model, first creating the groundswell with them and then, you know, uh, the university seeing the benefits and then usually partnering with us in a revenue share model. So it's it's not a, thankfully our programs are not a cost for the university. They are able to pass it on to the learners. But yeah, I mean, the top-down selling absolutely doesn't work for us. Building the groundswell, it has worked. Mm. Yeah. On that, 
Um, and I actually wanted to sort of pivot a little bit to the part of the value chain that you're dealing with, which is usually you're, you know, taking what the university has produced, like a fresh grad who's about to sort of begin their early career. Mm -hmm. um, what are you sort of seeing as the, you talked about skills gap being a, a massive issue and, you know, it's probably why corporates spend about $80 billion a year on corporate learning. But the reality is oftentimes that's a grudge buy, like, mm -hmm. you know, no one enjoys doing the learning and, you know, it's it's the smallest budget within, within corporates. Mm -hmm. Like, how do you see you know, what's driven that area of sort of ed tech to be so sort of bad and so not not desired by the learners? And how do you fundamentally think about sort of turning that model around? No, absolutely. Uh, so our learners, uh, Lucy, are typically people who are six months away from their first job in tech or up to three years in, in their career. So during this time frame, their needs tend to be different. The, the people who are entering the workforce require guidance, coaching, mentoring on what tech careers to choose. And then once they have clarity on that, how to get certified on those tech careers so that they have a globally acceptable skills. And then when they've got the certification, are they actually able to apply that to their job? Are they actually hands-on with the technology? So we are solving all three problems uh, for our users in slightly different ways. And it's it's pretty much like, you know, and it's true for a lot of ed tech. Running an ed tech is like being a personal trainer or running a gym, right? Nobody likes you. Nobody likes to show up to do an exercise or, or, or learn. Uh, so the, the, the things that you need to do to engage with them are absolutely different. The things that you need to motivate them to continue on this journey is absolutely different. And they will come back only if you have really made them fit, you know, which in our case would be helping them create a tangible outcome, which is either a career change or, uh, or the ability to crack uh, a job. So, so for us, uh, I mean, the journey starts with firstly uh, helping le learners assess themselves where they stand, what are their gaps to be really job ready, to be future proof in their skills. And then based on that, creating an absolutely personalized journey. And we are not taking them to, okay, these are the 30 things that you can do. We are always putting them into one program, which they are best suited for. Once they are into that program, that journey, powering that with a lot of insights, a lot of simplified idiot-proof learning ways of micro modules. You know, our typical learning modules are less than five minutes. We call ourselves the TikTok of, you know, skilling um, in, in that space. And then the power of the mentors, our gurus, uh, you know, we are fostering these one-on-one -on -one relationship, one-to-many relationship, which creates accountability, which creates visibility, which creates the true personalized advice for them in the journey. So that, that's, that's really helping us. Uh, and all of this is powered by tech. You know, it, it's not a, you WhatsApping your guru to know what you should do next. It's all coming to you, getting delivered to you real time based on what you have done or not done or how you're progressing with the assignments and activities. So, so that's really helped us to the extent possible, make coming to the gym an enjoyable process. We are at least putting good music. Uh, there's somebody to help you. There's good, 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 uh, you know, refreshment available after you finish and, and, and a good ambience in general. So uh, that's been our experience and approach to delivering this. Got it. And actually a great question came through on Slido, which is ask, and, and I think this is relevant to all three of you, how did edtech startups develop sort of recognition and legitimacy with employers so that actually it does attract students and it's worth sort of the students' time to, to kind of go through with that program? Uh, I can, because we work with a lot of employers, uh, I can I can talk a little bit about it. Uh, the only language employers understand is billable hours, right? So, so if the, their consultants are billable, uh, they will do anything uh, to partner with you, to work with you. So the way we engage with them, we take in a cohort of new hires. A typical employer would just let them float around, you know, learn on the job, which might be a six month, nine month, 12 month cycle. And before they realize employers have probably spent a hundred grand just on the direct cost of those employees. 
our promise is that our boot camp programs will make them billable and job ready in less than 90 days and usually we we make it happen in much shorter time span so it's a simple roi which helps us create that legitimacy and the stickiness with our b2b uh, organizations it is a really it's a really um interesting question and an important one for anything education because i mean at the end of the day it's legitimacy right it's you just mm -hmm. want to make sure that what you're teaching or what is being taken from your platform is legitimate um it's it's tricky i think you know we we sort of because anyone can go out there and make an incredible or a credly or whatever and have badges that you can download on linkedin and it's arguable how valid they are um so yeah you can definitely start that start there and kind of have that as a baseline um you could go down a like a research path potentially and have maybe like you could i don't know find a, a friendly phd student who maybe wants to like do some research-based credentially uh, stuff for your particular um, learning and maybe they have a, a particular kind of um, diagnostic or uh, I forgot what the word was, like a pedagogy um, that you, that's what, that, I actually didn't know that word before, like until like last, like two years ago. <laughs> anyway, um, so you could, you could do that. But I mean, we sort of went down the pathway of going, okay, well, let's look at what is currently accredited by leading universities like the ANUs and the Monashes of the world. Um, and say, okay, well, if we look at the learning outcomes that they promise to their students and that we can show that we can deliver those learning outcomes in a much more fun, much more engaging, much shorter, much more relevant way, um, will they, as a starting point, agree that we've actually met those learnings? So that was like a little bit of a due diligence process. Like we, it was just honestly sales. Like we just had to get in there and convince them that we had it um, and then putting a few you know, names and logos onto the program was important. Like our very first program, we took students to Facebook and to Google. We sat down with Guy Kawasaki. Like we managed, we just hustled, right? It was pure hustle. Um, and these days more with the um, digital version, we've kind of, you know, we're, we're partners with Atlassian. So we kind of, you, you end up kind of finding a situation where you can make those connections into corporate um, and bridge that with academics, which I think all three of us do in some, in some way as well. Um, and I guess the only other thing I'd add is that your alumni are your best, are your best bet. Like if you're in a situation where you're making great, you're making great learning outcomes and people are getting out there and they're starting their own businesses, they're employing other people, they're raising capital, they're getting good jobs, like your alumni are your best advertisement because um, they are proof. So I think sometimes, you know, invest early in those testimonials, invest early in making sure you get those like videos and, and like, yeah, the proof points the minute you get them and like slap those logos on. Like if you're early stage, just like <laughs> slap the logos on, track the testimonials, like do all the things that they tell you, like all of the marketing things. And it, it, it can help because that builds legitimacy. Awesome. Um I wanted to move on to sort of a bit more your broader view on sort of ed tech trends in general. Um, this this one actually was a question that came from John O'Brien, but I really liked it, which is what are the biggest misconceptions or overrated trends that you see get hyped up in ed tech today and is just not aligned to what you're seeing on the ground? Oh, can we have a dozen or just one? <laughs> 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 Maybe focus on the top two or three. <laughs> uh, I mean, from from the way we see it, uh, edtech is usually touted as the solution to everything. It is just one small part of the solution, and it uh, there are, there is there is a, a broad spectrum of you know uh, things that need to happen uh, in making someone job ready or making someone university ready or or school ready. So. Uh, so edtech is one small part of that. It's 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 a, a subscription usually doesn't solve the life's problem. So so uh, so that's one. I think the second part is uh, you know while there are big unicorns and we sometimes feels that it's a winner's take all market. I don't personally feel that's the case. It's still after 10, 20 years, right from the MOOC days. It's a very disaggregated market disaggregated at sector level, uh, you know, uh, geography level, language level, uh, you know, type of uh, outcomes that you're delivering. So, so it, it, it always be that because there won't be one global player which will dominate uh, 
everything and anything. So, you know, people think uh, a, a large ed tech unicorn is a one shop uh, 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 for all the solutions. So I think those are two, two observations from my end and my experience. I'm happy to go next on that. Uh, yeah, I agree. There's there's a lot of things to mention, and there's a lot of things that are positive. I know these are like what are the overhyped things, but there's a lot of things that I think are being hyped that have a real good change for impact as well. On the things that I think uh, are kind of on the flip side of what we're doing, for instance, like we're looking at how can we use AI to um, automate tutoring, but then that I think the opposite side of that is like what is the human connection uh, in education? and the lack thereof at the moment um, with there being such a huge gap between the num the, the student to teacher ratio at the moment. So over the last few years, um, if, if anyone's been following the, the market in education and especially high school teaching, um, there has been a huge shortage of teachers and teachers are leaving the industry at an extremely high rate, uh, either going to ed techs or just in general uh, leaving high school. Um, because of lack of funding, uh, you no know, stress. It's it's just it's become a very hard workplace for them, um, and I think you know that has resulted in some some teachers I've I've seen that have uh, taken two classes to themselves. So they they're starting to merge classes because they simply don't have enough teachers, and that's huge. And I think you know going into the future, it's like yes. Uh, like Amit said, you know, ed tech is not a solution for everything. And that is something you cannot solve with ed tech. Um, teachers leaving the industry and then, you know, even harder is that the gov uh, government's not incentivizing teaching as, you know, a, glorif a glorified role. And then you don't have enough people coming into the industry, but you have a lot leaving. And so I think over the next few years, you know, that that is going to be a huge problem outside of what ed tech can solve or if someone comes up with a solution i'd love to see it <laughs> but um you know that i think that's huge as well and that's definitely something that's a trend that is has been occurring for the last few years and i don't see anything slowing down there has been slight bumps in government funding towards teaching and towards education but whether that's enough to make a large impact we'll see i'm not sure I totally agree with, with both of them, uh, Amit and Dean, around that, you know, that multifaceted industry. Um, I think one of the exciting things is that there's a lot of gaps that aren't are still existing, you know, whether it is actually dealing with really tech illiterate teaching staff, because it is not a teacher's job to keep up with technology. Like they have enough shit to do, like seasonal language, they've got enough to do, keeping track of the students, keeping track of their curriculum, dealing with COVID, like teachers are at capacity and beyond. Um, and for us to expect them to be also taking on the job of keeping people upskilled to this level, it's not fair. So I think that there are, there's bits of, you know, there's areas where we can come in and help and support and connect industry in with that. And I think that's really exciting. Um, but I guess one of the overhyped things I, I hear a lot is this company is going to be the death of universities or like universe, like they're going to completely, like they'll never exist again. Um, and I just think that, you know, Amit's whole business model is around that hyper-personalization of learning, right? At some point, somebody might want to do a PhD, um, you know, and I think unis are great places for specialization, but there might be other points where you can kind of like break it down. So I don't think that the death of anything is happening anytime soon. I think there's going to be a lot of uh, dismantling. Um, I might take really briefly, like I'll just an example from my experience working in banking and financial services a few years ago, or quite a few years ago, when all of the, the fintechs were kind of bubbling up and the big four banks were like, oh, these neo banks are coming and blah, blah, blah. Essentially, all that these, these fintechs were doing were taking, identifying like a really small part of a giant system that sucked and really making it perfect. Um, so they'd maybe take the mortgage application process or the insurance approval process or the credit card. Like they were just breaking up this massive industry into lots of little bits. Um, and then over time, some of them got acquired, some of them merged, a lot of them failed. And I think that's what we're going to see with ed tech as well. There's lots of us coming at this from many different angles, breaking up this massive industry. Um, and in the next few years, are going to be really interesting to see what happens because, yeah, the credibility, the, you know, the outcomes, which ones are going to get break. Anyway, so sorry, rambling. I will <laughs> pause there. But I just, I just can't help but see the similarities in the industry trends. Um, and I think if you look to what happened in fintech, yeah, a few years ago, yeah. it would be interesting. 
And, and speaking of sort of like, you know, what does the landscape look like in a couple of years as everyone sort of carves off little bits of the problem to solve, for the part of education that you're tackling in each of your businesses, if you play the movie forward, let's say five to 10 years, what's changed? Like, what is your hypothesis of what that landscape is going to look like? I mean, uh, for, for, for our sector, uh, you know, the skills and workforce development sector, it's very expensive right now to deliver hyper-personalization in real time and with a human connect in that. I believe in the future, the unit economics of that will improve drastically with, with AI, with VR, and with peer-to-peer -peer, uh, abilities of, everybody is good at something, right? And, and that something would be able to reach somebody else who needs that help. So I think those three things will come together to make the unit economics of hyper-personalized, real-time human learning uh, affordable and scalable. And, 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 and that's not probably a 10-year thing. It'll probably happen in the next three to five years. And that's, that's the direction that we are taking our company in. Yeah, I love the idea around the hyper-personalization because of that I totally agree with that. I think, you know, when you look at current co courses at uni or just high school in general, the education system in general, it's like a factory. Um, and, you know, that's not at the fault of teachers. That's at the fault of the system itself. Um, the teachers are just following instructions. And, you know, that's a problem in itself because it's not personalized. Students are all at the same pace, learning the same thing, uh, and it's just getting churned out. And that was okay, you know, decades ago but it's not okay now especially when we have the resources and the technology to change these things um it's yeah it's infeasible and i think also on that it's like you're starting to see students uh and i love to hear other people's perspective on this but at least the general sentiment i've i've been seeing is that students are starting to not see the value of uni as much anymore um especially when you when you start looking at things like computer science right you have students that are realizing that you don't need to go to, to, to do a degree in order to get a job at your Canvas, at your Atlassians and stuff, right? Like you can teach, you can teach yourself that sort of things. And so I think the credibility of uni is there, but is it, is it necessary? Um, and I think that is also a, a reason why you're starting to see enrollment rates fall as well. Uh, obviously COVID would have had a big impact on that. So it's hard to see like, what is that the causality of it? But I definitely think that's been a huge impact. Um, one of the things for me that I'm super excited about, and as Amit mentioned, was the hyper-personalization um, because I think that learning in general, like, you know, being able to provide that teacher body for every person, like I mentioned before, is going to be huge. And that is, and like Amit said as well, that the, putting AI behind that allows you to create a one-on-one -on -one adaptive experience where you can have a body, uh, say this virtual tutor that understands where your learning gaps are. And I think that's a huge thing, right? Like when you're looking at personalization is understanding that all students are going to learn differently at different paces. And so understanding, you know, if if, a, if a, for instance, a cohort is supposed to be at some sort of baseline, but you have students above and beyond, that should be okay. And we should have systems that adapt to, you know, how, what these students are trying to learn and what these students don't know, instead of trying to teach them all at the same thing. And I think AI and hyper-personalization, like I mentioned, is going to be a huge thing. And again, that's not in 10 years, that's over the next three to five, for sure. Uh, and I don't think that, as I mentioned, I don't think that's going to take away from teaching. I think it's more of a supportive tool for teaching because teachers still need to be there because that social interaction is extremely important, especially at younger ages. And yeah, it's, you know, it's like we can't take away from the teaching, hence why that gap is a big problem, but you can at least start to support teachers by taking away some of the really hard things like trying to uh, you know, create course content for every student individually, depending on their needs. Um, that's something we can automate. And I think will definitely happen over the next three to five years. Great. I'll, uh, I'll throw on just a couple of things. If I'm playing my movie forward, they'll see. 
Um, okay, so one, I think we're in, in the higher education sector, we are definitely going to see a massive consolidation. There's going to be, um, there's already happening, like unis are buying each other, some are failing, so there'll be consolidation. I think I would love to take that personalization even further and say, we are going to see an ability for us to track and accredit um, learning such as travel, such as volunteering, such as like work experience, such as those other things that you do in your life, like you might have caring responsibilities, all of those kinds of things that you do, I think are going to start to add up to your version of who you are as a professional, who you are as, uh, you know, like a potential leader in the future. So I'm, I'm really excited to see how this sector overall starts to accredit and reward and recognise out of school learning. So that's why we're looking at this innovation gap here of can you blend the travel life experience with the tech you know, skills and the other stuff, like the social engagement that helps to, you know. So that's that's what another thing. And then I'm pretty excited to also see, um, yeah, so it's like consolidation, life skills, and I forgot my third point. If I come up with it, I will let you know. But yeah, I think it's, playing the movie forward is pretty exciting. And uh, yeah, 10 years. What year is that gonna be, 2032? That's really scary. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't want to think about my age at that stage. <laughs> uh, um, all of the early workers will be in charge by then. Oh, this is that was my third point. It was the fact that oh, we're going to see better integration with thought leadership and the systemic change, right? So I think exactly to Dean's point, you, you are not going to get ed tech solving all of this stuff. But right now, education is taken for granted at a you know political level, at a, at a policy level. Um, I would love to see it having a, a louder voice. I would love to have people like like you guys, you know, speaking loudly and broadly across across like the nation, across the globe about the stuff that we're seeing. Um, and I, I would like so I think you're going to see a, a raising of uh, consciousness and, and conversation, um, hopefully with education blending in more into politics, thought leadership and uh, industry growth. That's not awesome. Good. <laughs> Thanks. Love it. Um, I might pick one or two questions from sort of Slido and then we'll probably call it there because I know it's getting quite late for every time zone, I think. Um, so one that probably we haven't touched on because you guys aren't building directly in that space, but I'd love to get your view is sort of this K to six um, area. I know sort of there's a lot of research that says the earliest, you know, you can deliver outcomes in that sort of childcare space and and even in primary school, the, the better the outcomes for the student. But what do you believe is sort of the future for ed tech um, in that K to six space? If you have a view, a strong view. No hot takes on this one. Um, I mean, I think apart from the fact that the students entering K to, K to six are going to be, you know, techno, tech, more technology native than we've ever seen before. I think that's going to be an interesting, you know, we've all seen the, what's like the, that little video of the little girl who thought that everything is a hand sanitizer pump, like, you know, or the kid that thinks that like a magazine is a broken iPad, like we've seen those videos already. So I think just trying to predict what that could mean for that young age group could be really fascinating. Um, that's my warm, lukewarm take. <laughs> I think K to six has a unique opportunity to complement the learning that happens in school. I, I, I wonder if kids will stop going to school in that age group ever. Uh, you know, there won't be any alternative to formal schooling, at least till K to six. So the opportunities are to complement it with the fun things that might be missing in the curriculum, right? Whether it's about robotics or whether it's about sports or whether it's about, you know, just, uh, you know, how to have some life skills. I think I personally, as a dad, <laughs> that's what I believe the biggest opportunities lie in K to 12. The extracurricular stuff on it. Yeah. Awesome. Um, then this one, I think, probably for Dean, because you are the AI guru here, but do you think that in the future sort of teachers can actually be replaced with AI? And is that even a reality that we want? Or should we, we, should we be focusing on supporting and empowering teachers? Yeah, so at no point do I think teachers should ever be replaced, because I think, I think the social interaction between teachers and students is extremely important. Having, having a human in the loop is important in general, uh, and so at no point should teachers ever be replaced. And that's why I said it's so important, like over the next few years, that that teacher shortage needs to be addressed and that I can't see being done by ed EduTech. Um, 
you know, even if you introduce the idea of virtual teachers, it does not fill that gap. And so that's still going to be a big problem. Uh, but that's more of a fundamental issue and uh, a governmental issue, which that's you know, a whole different ball game. I think what EdTech can do and what AI can do is support teachers. Um, you know, you still have teachers that are spending hours creating content, spending hours creating resources, assessments, um, dealing with Q&A, dealing with discussions with students. And that, you know, marking is a huge thing as well, you know, like essay, essay marking, for instance. These things, I think, is where AI can really come in and support teachers, take away the tedious tasks that are, you know, repetitive, um, take away things like marking, take away things like answering Q&A. Um, you know, the, these, these are the things there where teachers can be supportive. And that's huge because if you think about how many, like one of our team members, um, his, his mom spends weekends marking essays in English, right? And outside of work hours. And that's huge alone. So, you know, you take something like AI and provide assistance with marking, like that's a massive market in itself, right? Because then you're saving, you're saving parents, uh, you're saving them their weekends, right? Where they can then go spend that with their families. And that helps with stress, that helps with anxiety. Like that is a huge weight off shoulders. And so again, I think just supporting teachers and supporting educators is going to be the biggest influence with things like AI. And supporting learners, of course, that's extremely important. But, you know, in doing so, the repercussions of that are helping teachers out because, you know, teachers feel like they're under a lot of pressure to try and personalize for students when it's it's quite infeasible with large classrooms. You know, like you have 28 people in a classroom, you cannot personalize anything to your students individually, right? So I think, again, personalization uh, is going to be huge there's gaps like marking, there's gaps like content creation where we're trying to help out. Um, and then asynchronous learning discussions, all of these can be automated and can support teachers over the next next while. Awesome. Um, one last question, just because I noticed that it's popped up quite a few times on Slido, but people are very interested, it seems, in the fundraising journey when you're an ed tech. And especially now, I think, you know, with the context being, it looks like we're heading into what could potentially be a recession, probably one, you know, circumstances we haven't seen in maybe over a decade. And so in these times, how do you guys actually think about in, you know, fundraising and even just finding ed tech investors that are able to assess, assess you fairly, I think, because, you know, for someone coming in cold, if you compare an ed tech to a B2B SaaS, you're probably going to get a rude awakening. So yeah, how, how are you all thinking about it? For us, what's worked is really when you're talking to a, a VC, uh, make sure they get ed tech and they understand and passionate about ed tech because not everybody's passionate or you know gets it or, or cares about it as much as some people do. So, so being as talking to specialists within the, uh, the, the, the VC organization or talking to a VC, which is a specialist in ed tech, definitely is half the job done. Uh, and, and the other half is obviously, even if you're building in Australia, it has to be an idea which has a global reach and the ability to solve problem at a global scale. I think that definitely makes it much, much easier. And thirdly, uh, of course, you know, uh, today's time having a few years of runway locked in in the bank is a great feeling. So don't raise if you don't have need to. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, I haven't, got, I, I haven't got too much more to add on that. Where you know we're in a pretty comfortable position right now, so it hasn't been something we're looking into uh, recently. Um, and very fortunate for the for that fact. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it it looks really difficult at the moment. And I've been talking to a few founders who are trying to put together stuff at the moment and, you know, getting getting uh, less than less than kind valuations, um, uh, de definitely. And having to provide a lot more traction than, you know, what was eight, nine months ago. 
even. So it's definitely more difficult. Uh, I haven't got too much more on that as I haven't put enough research into it. So I don't want to, I don't want to feel the conversation with something that is uh, not research based, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> Fair enough as well. I mean, I think, yeah, it's, it's a great question that is coming up a lot and like no, no shade to VCs and investors on the call at all, but founders yeah. know that the more that people can talk down the, uh, you know, the valuations to expect, the better deals they can get. So there's a little bit of push and pull there. You've still got some power there, founders, like make sure your mission is really well, um, you know, really well uh, clarified. The size of your market is clarified. Um, I think, you know, uh, Amit's point around finding passionate investors who know and understand and love the space, I think is, is a great call. Um, in terms of like, if you're super, super, super early stage and you're looking for people to help you out, I mean, we talk about valuations, but if you're raising on a safe round, on a safe note, you don't necessarily need to have a locked in valuation. You kind of just get a cap. So um, don't necessarily get hung up on that. If you are just looking to get your first couple hundred K in just to buy your first dev or something like, I guess it really depends on where you are in your, in your journey. Um, you know, if, if you're kind of, yeah, I, I think what we're seeing is definitely like this sort of flight to, um, you know, revenue, flight to profit, like, you know, not necessarily profit, but just more of the business fundamentals, it's a different story than what we were getting told last year about like, you know, like stand, stand, stand to like get the growth. And now people are wanting to really see that cash hitting the balance sheet. Um, mm. And so I think I actually don't hate it because it's a bit of, yeah, it's kind of like, that's what I thought business was when I first got into business is like <laughs> make more money than you spend. <laughs> and when I got into, when I started to get into the VC world, I was like, oh, this isn't good. Um, so I think, you know, if you, if you uh, focus on your business fundamentals, you focus on your, giant massive mission and you can show that you've got a really particular insight on your customers um, I don't think you're going to be in too bad a position but yeah just just be realistic and understand that there might be a situation where um, if you've got for example two different types of revenue maybe one's a service revenue and one's a, a tech revenue um, VCs and investors might value those revenues at different multiples if that makes sense so like one might be four times one might be eight times and that might change up the value of your business so there's just some different levers being pulled right now um but if you've got a good story just keep telling it yeah awesome love ending on a positive note so i think that's it for everyone and thanks for joining us yeah thanks so much lucy a huge shout out to our panel today jeanette amit and dean and lucy for moderating today's panel thank you so much for everyone tuning us here give us an emoji react to show us appreciation and you can always Follow us on our Slack community. Um, have a great night and see you guys for the next one. Thanks. Bye. Thank you very have much. Good night, everyone. See ya. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jeanette. Thank you. You're awesome. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Okay. <laughs> we're just jumping off. All right. Bye. Yeah, we're just jumping oh. off. Bye, everyone.